Welcome to another episode of Boss Bitch Radio. If you are new here, welcome. I am Diane Flores. I am your go-to source for all things real talk on fitness, nutrition, exercise, bodybuilding stuff. We're, we're still smattering a little bit of that into the topics, but uh, I'm glad you're here if you are a new listener. If you are a regular listener, listen, this is a little bit different than what I usually do. However, you be knowing this is my passion project, the podcast. It's almost three years, friends. And something that I have learned over the years and worked on myself personally is my finances. Now, again, disclaimer, I am not a professional. I have no background in investing or anything like that. This is just one girlfriend to another girlfriend who might be struggling getting her proverbial money shit together. Okay. Because I'm going to share some vulnerable stories, but I'm I'm excited. You know, I'm excited today's episode's different, but some vulnerable stories to hopefully inspire you to take action towards your financial health. And this is all based off of reading I've done, lessons I've learned, and lots and lots of mistakes, and honestly, research and something that I've just been really passionate about since I uncovered how much control we have over our finances, right? I'm not going to be here to scream at you that you need a budget because one strategy that I've learned this year is very different and it does not include a budget in the formal sense of the word. Okay. Yes, you heard me right. No budget. All right. Now you're probably wondering, okay, why a podcast about money? And like I said at the top of the episode, money is such a source of stress for some people, right? I was married once before, a long time, long, long ago, and money tended to be an issue that we struggled with, and it was a source of stress in our relationship. And I know it's a stressor for a lot of women that I work with and deal with as far as being able to afford the things that improve their health, right? And that, of course, is my hard and fast mission on this planet is to get through to people the importance of improving their health. And oftentimes that comes with investing in products or services that are going to help you be better as a human for the rest of your life. Now, you can most certainly do those things for free, right? Google is an amazing research assistant, and you can figure out all these things on your own. That is a no-brainer. I have told you guys that since probably day one, right? Like You can figure out everything you need, but the problem does not lie in the information. It lies in the implementation and actually taking action. And a lot of times when people are able to use their money wisely towards something health-related and actually see their results expedited, they then value it, right? It's like you don't you don't know the value of something until you truly experience it for yourself. And this is not to you know necessarily guide anyone towards my direction. It's whatever you choose, right? Whatever your flavor of that looks like, being able to invest in that. Maybe that's some kind of Maybe it's even like a retreat that you go to for you and a partner for like marriage or communication. That's a part of your health. That's going to help lower stress, right? So there's so many ways that our money can help us live a more fulfilling life. And a lot of times, like I mentioned, it is going to be a barrier for some people. Now, I wanted to dive into this episode. And I was very skeptical because I'm like, you know, like, who the fuck am I? I'm just the boss bitch. Like, who's going to listen to my financial advice? I'm not one to be braggadocious and do any of that fun stuff. But I know how much that money or lack thereof is a barrier for people to take care of their health. So if I've made these improvements, I've been able to do some things. I'm like, listen, I'm not going to do it. You can do it. Now, I don't make New Year's resolutions anymore from the fitness side of things, right? Because I've been doing this every day. I know what I need to do, okay? I know how to eat. I know how to train. I know how to cardio. I know how to reduce stress. All the things, right? I'd be making the programs for y'all, so I get it. However, 
what I choose to to really do when when the new year comes, and this has probably been for the last seven to eight years, is I make other targeted goals that improve my life that are not just fitness related. There's always things I can clean up and work on in my fitness. And I I recently hired a new coach that that is helping me with more athletic style training because I'm wanting to switch some things up there. But again, I have the financial means to invest in that, right? And not try to figure it out on my own because then I will second guess myself and probably try to do eight different programs melded into one. I be knowing, you be knowing. That's how it goes sometimes when you get on the Googs, right? You get on the Googs and you look for a program and then you're like, ooh, I like this one, but I don't like that day. So I'm going to do this program. And like, then you've got this conglomeration of like five different trainers programs that don't make any sense. And so I just throw money at it and then like, you know, and I'm going to show you how you can do that too. Now, the point that I was making with that is that I don't need to do fitness resolutions any longer because I have all these habits in place. So what I choose to do are make other goals. Most of them usually align with targets I'm trying to make in my business, whether that is a revenue goal and or my own personal financial goals. And then I have also like relationship goals when it comes to my partner, my family, and like things that I want to be better at and be present. And then, you know, some other little miscellaneous things. But the biggest bulk of my goal setting strategy is around financial goals. Okay. Every year I make better financial decisions. I make better investments. I set myself up for long-term wealth and I'm making better decisions about how my money is working for me. And this year I wanted to dive even further into financial freedom and wealth and investing and being a lot smarter with my money. And I want to share that with you because I think that it, you know, I feel like I look to other women for financial advice. I resonate with other women my age. And so the people that I follow and the people that I listen to are generally in my age rate, age range. They're generally in my age range. And I've also found a couple other financial gurus, if you will, that are men that I, I resonate with. I like their style. I like how they're very straightforward and direct. And you'll find that once I share with you who these two people are. Now, if you've made it this far, congratulations listening to my word salad. And I want you to know that today's episode is for you if you feel stress around your finances, you cannot seem to get ahead financially, maybe you're living paycheck to paycheck, you got some overdrafts that hit here and there because you're not managing your money effectively. Okay. No shade because I've I've done it too. It's also for you if you stress out on investing in your own health and fitness because you don't have the financial means. And the reason why I put that in here as an important note as far as who this is for is because, spoiler alert, if you do not do it now, you will spend more money later on illness. So let me repeat that. If you do not invest in your health and fitness now, whether that is financially, whether that's time, whatever, you will spend more money on it later. Now that's going to come by way of illness. That's going to come by way of prescriptions, missed days from work, having to go to the doctor, you know, all these things that people don't really think about that actually cost them money when they don't take care of their health. And so that is really my message for you, besties, today, is you will gain so much more from investing in your health and fitness if you see the importance of that, right? And I know the problem with a lot of us, because I've been guilty of this too, is, oh, I'll worry about that when it gets there, right? Like, you know, I want to live my life, YOLO, you know, all the things. And we think we're invincible to a degree. And let me tell you, we're not. (laughs) Okay. And even myself, right? I consider myself a very healthy person. I do, you know, 90% of the things that I would say classify as a healthy lifestyle. And I've realized more and more probably within the last five years after I turned 40 that like, yo, you're not, you're not going to be immune to some of these things. So 
spending, you know, spending time and investing on your health and fitness will pay dividends in the future that you will want, right? And I don't need to go in that laundry list of things that will benefit you. You know, y'alls are smart. You'd be knowing, right? So the other thing is if you are lost on how to tackle your debt or invest for your future, we're going to dive into a little bit of that today. I'm not getting super into the weeds, but I have some fun things I want to talk to you guys about. And then for somebody who is obviously interested in achieving financial freedom. Now, there are a plethora of financial gurus, sites, apps, all the things. I'm just going to share with you what's worked for me. I'm going to talk a little bit about two people that I look to for financial advice, and I don't agree with both of them 100% either, right? So there are things I take from each of them that seem to work for my current situation. And also, everybody's situation is different. So this a lot of this stuff might not apply for you, but I also am going to talk about some exciting things when it comes to those of you that enjoy traveling. Now, I really enjoy traveling. One of my goals I set, I want to say it was probably five or six years ago, was that I wanted to get out of town, (laughs) get out of town, partner. I wanted to get out of town at least one weekend a month. I I think I set this probably actually, it was probably like five years ago because I remember, I remember (laughs) <laughs> my life period at that time and where I was. And it didn't have to be anything crazy, right? It could be like a weekend getaway with my my partner. It could be a full-on trip. It could be a business trip. It could be any of those things. And I would say that I have done that almost every single month. And that might not be a big deal for some, but for me, that was a huge deal. So let's take a step back. I want to paint a picture of where I was to where I am now, because I think having some of that gives context to why I feel that this episode is so important. Okay. Like I said, I'm not a financial guru and I came from parents who were raised in poverty. To me, there's a difference between being broke and being poor and then being, you know, being in poverty. And my dad, he, you know, I've been spending a lot of times with a lot of time with my parents, my dad and my stepmom. And they are both from the Azores Islands, which if you're not familiar, are some islands off the coast of Portugal. I am Portuguese. I'm a Portuguese princess. Holla to my fellow Portuguese princesses. But my dad came from poverty and he had zero education. He you know, once he moved to the States, he was about 13 years old. He lived paycheck to paycheck. And he had no real examples of financial responsibility or wealth or any of those things, right? I was talking to him the other day and he was telling me a story about how I was asking him about my grandfather and at what point they moved here. Like, how was that for him? If you haven't done this with your parents, especially if you have parents that are from another country, I highly suggest you do it. You will be humbled, enlightened, and have a whole new respect for your parents. And so we had a long trip. We were taking my mom to Stanford. And so I just started asking my dad a bunch of questions, you know, like how did his parents meet? And, you know, where did they live? And how was it, you know, going to school and things like that? And my dad tells me that he did not own a pair of shoes to wear regularly, okay, like how we do, we just put our shoes on, we don't think about it these days, right, until he was 12 years old, okay, let that sink in, all right, imagine, if you have children that are in and around that age, just imagine your children not having shoes until they're 12, right, my dad said we had one pair of shoes that we wore to church on Sunday, we put them on to go to church, we took them off when we came home, and then we didn't see them again until we went to church. So one pair of shoes that we wore on Sunday, and then they just ran around barefoot. So of course, I had like many follow up questions like, did you cut your feet and like all kinds of weird shit, which yes, he did. But just to paint the picture of like, like my parents came, you know, here with essentially nothing. And then when they got here, they did not continue their education here. So it was, you know, blue collar jobs and the like, you know, my, my dad always had two to three jobs. He was a hustler. My stepmom, the same, you know, she had a job and then she would clean houses and do all kinds of ran, random things. And we never went without. However, I knew that that was not something I wanted for myself, right? I saw how hard my parents worked. And I was just like, I can't like, I work hard now, but it's, It's different, right? It's a different kind of hard. However, again, just to paint a little bit of a picture, fast forward, I was a broke teenager.
teen mom. Okay, I was on welfare. I was on WIC, which is a it's called Women, Infants and Children. It's a uh, a program here that the state of California runs and they give you like food vouchers for certain things that you go to. They're like food stamps. I was on food stamps. I had lived in what I guess we would consider like the housing projects um, here where I like qualified for a specific area where it was like low income families were living. Like I went through the gamut, okay, and did all those things. And the journey to where I am now was rocky, right? But when I was in my single mom days and like single, single mom days, right? Like I was a single mom with two small children by the time I was 18 years old. When I was pregnant with my daughter, the father of both of my children just decided to up and leave. So I literally raised them solo until I got married um, when they were five and six. So I was doing all the things, right? I worked two jobs. I had like a medical field job. I also had a side job at Gold's Gym. So I was, I was like, I wasn't like rolling in it, right? I wasn't coming from like a family of wealth or any of that. And now, you know, obviously there's many, many years in between, almost 30 uh, to be quite honest. Now, you know, I have my own investment property. I have financial accounts that work for me. I have zero debt. And I live a life that is generally stress-free around finances. What that means for me is I have an excellent credit score. If I needed to, for some reason, I could rely on a loan or something of that nature. But I don't stress about where my money's coming from and paycheck to paycheck and, you know, am I going to be able to pay this bill and, you know, juggling things around anymore. That was my life for a very long time and it was painful. It was stressful. And I don't wish that for anyone. Okay. The journey again, like I mentioned, was rocky. There were periods of time in my late twenties to early thirties where I was dealing with Bank, you know, a bankruptcy and uh, short selling a home that was a terrible purchase idea that me and my husband made in our early days of marriage. I've had some really terrible investments. I've made careless credit card spending choices and frivolous spending. And I think we can probably all relate to some of that in some way. And it wasn't taught about money or finances or how to create wealth. Again, blue collar family, parents without education. I had to figure out a lot on my own. And oftentimes that was the hard way and the wrong way, okay? But one thing that I always prided myself on was that I didn't rely on my family to borrow money, right? So I can honestly say, and you know, I even talked to my parents about this the other day, that I never once had to come to my parents, even amidst my single mom woes, <laughs> and ask them for money, like a loan or anything, right? I'm sure there were times where my parents were like, oh, here's a hundred bucks or here's 60 bucks or whatever, like go put some gas in your car. And they like gifted me money here and there, but it was very, very rare. Like they didn't really have a ton to be giving. So fast forward, I started to figure things out. I either worked more back then, or I figured out how to negotiate my debts, which is a skill. And if you're persistent, you can really work some magic. Okay. I, I'm not really doing that anymore, but that was something that I did a lot, which was like transferring debts or transferring balances from certain cards to other cards that had like 0% interest. And I figured out early on how to establish credit because my dad was very, very adamant about having a excellent credit score. So that was something that I maintained very, very early on until I got married and then ended up making bad decisions and filing bankruptcy. But even then, with my credit score going down to like 500 or something awful to now it being like 820 or something great, it has been a process, okay? And let me just tell you, when you have an excellent credit score, you have a lot of power, okay? So now you guys got a lay of the land, okay? Now, seven, it was probably about seven, eight years ago, there was one book that I read that changed the game for me and it turned things around. Now, I was never one to really pick up a book on finances or be interested. It was intimidating, right? I'm like, I don't know how to speak this investing language and whatnot. And I was given a book, 
by my ex-husband of all people. We were divorced at this point, I think maybe two or three years, maybe a little bit longer. And I said, you know, he said to me that he was reading this book and he found found great value in it. Now, my ex-husband's a great dude, but he doesn't read. So I'm like, okay, if homie read this and he's telling me, like, I should probably read it. So what I did was I took the book, I spent a weekend. It, it sat on my kitchen table for God knows how long. And then I'm like, I was avoiding it. And then finally, I'm like, you know what? The kids, I didn't have anybody at home. And I'm like, I'm going to tackle this. I spent one weekend and it's a very easy read. And I devoured the whole book. I had a notepad full of notes. I think I even had my laptop up and I was just like figuring this shit out. Now, the book was Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover. If you have debt, read this book. It works. Okay. Now it works just like your health and fitness if you do the things that you need to do for it to work. So it's not going to just like you master out the plan and then like you don't, you know, you don't actually apply yourself. If you apply yourself and you deploy some discipline, much like your fitness goals, it will work for you. Okay. Now, just so you get an idea, I was on, I had a lot of debt. Okay. I had some IRS debts I needed to pay back. I had some uh, bankruptcy that we were, we didn't, we, (laughs) when we filed bankruptcy back in the day, it wasn't the kind that like wipes it clean, like a chapter seven, it's the repayment, um, reorganization of your payments. So I had to pay all of my debts back. I didn't get like off the hook and like, it's gone. Unfortunately, (laughs) um, I had to actually, you know, pay my responsibilities like a a good citizen. So I did. And, um, let me tell you, it was, it was, it was a lot. So I paid off $60,000 worth of debt in one year. Yes, you heard me correctly in one year. And I know what you might be thinking. Some of you might think like, there's no way I make just about that or a little bit more than that. Like, how is this even possible? You would be surprised. Okay. Because when I read this book, I most certainly thought to myself, I don't know how the hell this is going to happen. Like, I am living lean. I'm living pretty lean right now. Spoiler alert, I wasn't. Okay. So it takes you through the process so you can understand how to figure these things out. Now, again, since then, I have purchased investment property. I've set up appropriate investment accounts for my future. I learned how to manage my money. And now it's working for me. And it's no longer a primary source of stress at all, which feels very weird to say. Because again, when you are used to operating one way, and this, I think this kind of relates to like fitness, right? You associate with not being a healthy person or a fit person or, you know, not having willpower, all these things. I had those sort of money mindset beliefs before where I'm like, oh, I am come from a poor family. I've been broke. I was you know, a statistic, you know, pregnant, pregnant teen mom under all the government aid. This is just who I'm going to be, right? Not the case. So it feels very good. And I want that for anybody who has money stress. All right. So if you started daydreaming, come back to me a little bit. It's going to get juicy. We're going to dive into some action steps. Are you ready? All right. Now we're going to move on to the next piece. It definitely feel like if debt is something you struggle with, you have to tackle the mindset stuff and the money makeover with Dave Ramsey. And this next resource also covers that a little bit, but he does refer to uh, Dave Ramsey's book. So with that being said, the next person that I really enjoy their way of describing finances and really getting you to understand and comprehend in a way that you feel empowered is Ramit Sethi. Some of you may know him. He has a Netflix series. It's called How to Get Rich. And I highly, highly recommend you go watch this first to get you motivated, right? So before you dive into the action steps that I'm going to talk about through his through the stuff that I've consumed of his, I do, I do recommend you watch it because it will motivate you, right? It's like, it's like when you want to start a fitness program and you like, you want to see, you want to see like how the workouts go and all the things and you're like watching it like motivates you, right? Like, I don't know, maybe I'm a weirdo, but I like to watch people work out because it like motivates me to work out. So when you watch this, what you'll do is you'll, it'll surprise you. And you'll start to see yourself in some of these stories. Essentially, he follows people around. He's got some couples. He's got some single people. And 
I give you permission to binge watch this because it will teach you a lot. And you'll see some things that these people are doing that seem like no brainers to us watching from the outside. Like, yo, you have a bank account for your dog, right? Like this is just one of the, the, the episodes, but again, super important. Okay. Now, once you have done the Dave Ramsey thing, you have watched the Netflix series. I highly suggest you now buy his book. Now it is called, I will teach you to be rich. And that is by Ramit Sethi. Now, again, I'm not going to dive too far into this. I'm going to sort of just like rapid fire, just tell you some things that I found incredibly useful that I'm using. And if this perks up your ears, definitely do the work. Okay. One thing that I loved is there is no budgeting, right? He mentions some different apps and things like that for you to kind of get an idea of where you're spending your money. And that is something that I highly suggest if you have never done. But the premise of his strategy, okay, is putting your expenses or your money, I should say, into spending category goals. Okay. So one category is your fixed costs, right? Your rent, your utilities, your debts. That should be 50 to 60% of your take-home pay, okay? After the IRS takes its goodies, your take-home pay. Then you want to move down to investments. Your investments are going to be things like a 401k, a Roth IRA, et cetera, et cetera. That should be 10% of your take-home pay. Then the next category is savings goals. So think things like vacations, gifts, a down payment for a house, emergency funds, things like that. That should be around 5 to 10%. And then your favorite bucket is guilt-free spending. And this is why I'd be loving me some Rammy, okay? Because if I can spend my coin guilt-free, sign me up, right? So that should be a nice, decent chunk of 20 to 35% of your take-home pay. Now, there are some different parameters he gives based on like what your current age is and things like that, where that might fluctuate. And obviously, every situation is a little bit different. However, this is a general idea of his philosophy. Now, here's what I did and here's what I suggest you do. Step one is open up a Google document and start brain dumping some action steps to clean up your finances. Now, if you're not a Google doc kind of girl or guy, then a notepad, but this needs to be somewhere where it is in your line of view and it does not go somewhere and start to collect dust. So if it's going to collect dust in your Google files and you're not going to open it back up, then something tangible and visible that you can actually write with. That's my preferred method. I have a notebook. Now you're going to open up a tab with your bank statements, or if you're old school, just bust those babies out. If you got the envelope mailers, open up your bank statements. I would say, and this is what I did. You don't have to do what I did, but this is what I did. And it was great and it was fun and I enjoy it. And it makes me excited to look at my money every day. I combed through three to four months worth of my spending. Now, it's a little different for me because I have personal accounts and I have multiple business accounts. So I did this for both. Okay. I went through three to four months of spending. I found recurring memberships that I wasn't using and I canceled them. I found double subscriptions of shit. And what I was also looking at, and this is where things get fun, is I looked at my biggest spend areas. So what top areas did I spend the most money in so I could decide on next steps, which were another strategy I'm going to talk about. And I'm not going to get too in depth, but it's something I love and I'm excited about and it's and I've been seeing it work. But it's looking at which credit cards to optimize. Now, I know what you're thinking. Credit cards, what, huh? Isn't that like the holy grail of like, you just don't go there? I'm going to talk about that in a second. However, if you like to travel, keep listening, okay? Now, with the credit cards and this sort of strategy, this is something that Ramit talks about, the credit card has to get paid off every month, zero exceptions. If you cannot do this, just stop listening and don't even attempt this, okay? LOL, just don't. Because I am not tempted by credit cards to be spending frivolously whatsoever. I have not had credit cards for 
seven years, I have not had, I had a business credit card, but I have not had any personal credit cards or loans or anything like like that for seven years. Y'all, I abstained. I went straight abstinence. And then when I read this book and I thought, fucking, I'm so mad that I did not utilize the strategy. However, I wouldn't have been ready for this unless I knew I wasn't going to be tempted by credit cards. I don't think I could go into the strategy. So you have to know yourself. Okay. Then the next thing I decided once I read the book is, and now he walks you through, I believe it's like a six week process for you to go through this entire thing. And I did take my time with it and, you know, went through the entire book and and did these steps incrementally. So I wasn't trying to bite off more than I can chew. But the next piece of that is deciding what kinds of accounts that you want to invest in. Now, this varies based on several things. It based It's based on your income and it also matters if you're a business. So some of these things are going to be different just based off of those two things. So again, thinking about things like 401ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs, HSAs, which is a health savings account, and things of that nature. The other things that you'll do in this process is I moved some of my accounts, like my checking account, my savings accounts, and things like that. I moved them to accounts that worked for me rather than charging me fees. Oh my gosh, imagine that, right? So what I did was uh, moved, I moved over, I had uh, just a personal savings account at Chase, right? Which does zero for you, by the way. Your money just like hangs out there and it's just parked. It's not really earning anything. And I had like a decent amount of money in there. And I'm like, "Mm," you know, as soon as I heard about a high yield savings account, I was instantly also irritated at myself that my money has been sitting there for years and I could have been generating some money even just on a very basic level without like going into stocks and bonds and all that fun stuff. So I moved over to a high yield savings account. I also canceled my Chase personal checking and I moved to a Schwab um, investment checking account and those two changes alone are going to get me money back and put money back into my pocket. Okay. Very easy. I know it's stressful, especially if you've been banking with the same bank since you were like 18. You got to get that old mindset out of your brain and just be okay with doing new things, right? It's like everything in your life. All right. So that's kind of the foundations. Um, Again, I just touched lightly on it because I really want you to dive in and kind of see for yourself, how this can apply for you. Because if I just kind of touched on all the things, then it would be information overload and it wouldn't apply for everybody. So let's talk about the fun stuff, which is optimizing your credit card usage. Now, if you're still with me, that means you're a responsible credit user, not an agreement. I am a responsible credit user. I am not going to open up credit cards and then go put a bunch of shit on it. Don't even come to me and buy my shit on a credit card because I'm going to be like, bitch, what are you doing? Don't be doing that. (laughs) Okay. Use credit cards strategically and there are ways to maximize rewards, maximize benefits. And the reason why I love this is because like I said earlier is one of my goals was to get out of town, get out of town once a month. Okay. Now with specific credit cards, if you know what you're doing and I've spent probably way more hours on researching this than I should, but it's it's fun. It's kind of addicting. But you can earn travel points and you can earn other benefits, other perks about like of, of things that you already use, right? So certain credit cards. So for example, um, I signed up for a Chase Sapphire card. I have an MX Platinum card. With those, you get certain perks like clear, right? So if you travel and you don't want to wait through the normie line, which is, you know, how much fun we love doing that, you get a credit for clear, which I believe is like, I want to say it's like almost $200, which is an expedited process. It's like a concierge service. You walk up, they walk you through the line and boom, you're through security at the airport way faster. The American Express Platinum Card gets you into the lounges at the airports, which is huge, 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 huge. If you like to travel because these American Express Centurion lounges are fantastic. You can go in there. The food is free. The alcohol is free. Great Wi-Fi. They have couches and chairs and a massage room where you can get like a neck massage and like all this shit. It's kind of crazy. It's weird to even think 
not that it exists, but it's a thing. And if you use things like Uber and Lyft and Instacart, you can sign up at the right time with these cards and you get these things for free, which is fantastic. I think DoorDash is maybe even one of those on there as well. So you have to, again, you have to do your research. Now, one resource that I personally loved when I was going through this. And you have to be careful because, you know, again, some of these websites, they will get probably some kind of either affiliate fee or some sort of kickback, I would assume, for linking up certain cards. But you can still do the research and not go through their links if you don't want to. I'm big on supporting people when they do the research for shit. So it didn't bother me. But this website that I went to is called thepointsguy.com. When you go on there, have fun, but you're going to get into all the cards, what could possibly work for you. And I found business cards, credit cards, and personal credit cards that earn points. So again, when you go back to open up a Google Doc or a notepad, the reason why you need to figure out where your biggest spend areas are for this strategy, because if you know where you're spending most of your money, you can choose the right cards that are going to give you the most rewards, right? So for example, the Chase Sapphire card, I believe they give you five points for every dollar that you spend when you dine out at restaurants. It's a great card if you eat out a lot. I believe they also have a higher points reward system for groceries and certain things. Don't quote me on that. But you'll want to know what card to use when. Now, you can get some of these people that hack the credit card point systems, get very into it. They have like 17 cards. Y'all, I am not even trying to be doing that right now, okay? I have one personal one. It's a Chase Sapphire because I'm content with that. And I have two business cards because a lot of there, there's a lot of crossover for me, right? There's a lot of things that the business pays for that's also kind of like a Diane thing, right? So, you have to know which ones are going to meet your needs. Now, they talk about different kinds of rewards or benefits, whether it's cash back on everyday purchases or travel points for frequent flyers. There's also some other perks that a lot of people don't know about, which are things like extended warranties and travel insurance. So if you are making purchases on a lot of these cards, they offer that. So if something goes wrong with something you buy and you use your Chase Sapphire or your American Express, and let's say the company you purchase for isn't going to uphold a warranty or whatever, you call up a- Amex or Chase and you're like, yo, kick in <laughs> kick in the um, bennies here, all right? And also travel insurance. So if something happens or whatever, these are things with the credit cards. Now you have to make the purchases on these credit cards. Now there's another way to maximize your rewards. So once you have the right cards, you can strategize that, right? So this might involve using specific cards, again, for certain categories where you earn the most rewards and really accelerating that by you're you're spending the money anyways. And that's how the way that I justified it because I don't get tempted by credit card by using my credit cards, right? They give me like a crazy spend amount that I that I'm allowed to spend, but I don't I'm not tempted by that because I'm not I'm like, nope, nope. We pay this shit off every motherfucking month. Okay. Now you might use one card for groceries to earn cash back. And you might use another one for dining out or earning extra points. Do your research. Now, there are some other great perks. You can get sign-up bonuses. Now, many credit cards will offer you a sign-up bonus if you're a new card holder once you spend a certain amount within the first few months. Now, if you're going to be putting all of your expenses on there, that's not hard to do, okay? For example, I opened up the Chase Sapphire and it was a 60,000 point bonus was you had to spend $4,000 within the first, I think it's three months. Y'all, that's not hard to do because I put almost everything that I pay through that card. So my utility bill, my AT&T, any of the recurring purchases that I have on a daily basis my groceries, my gas, whatever can go on that card. And it's not hard. Like if you're putting your day-to-day, your everyday expenses that can be put on a card, 
on that card, it's really easy to hit that four G's in three months if it's your day to day stuff. Now, if you're just going to go blow a bunch of random money, don't blame it on me. Okay, but this is a way to take advantage of those bonuses. So plan your spending accordingly. And again, just do not overspend to carry a balance just to earn the bonus. It's not worth it. It's very important that you follow that piece of advice, okay? Because I am not trying to make you go into debt. You can keep track of your rewards and your balance and all of the redemption options. They they do that all for you in the site. So you can log on. And there are tons of travel perks you can book directly through like Chase or Amex for your travel and you'll earn even more points and you can use some of your points there to pay for some of that. Like I've got free hotel rooms. We're going to get some free flights here in just a bit to do some travel because of our points, which is great. Now, something you have to keep in consideration is that some of these, when you are booking them, they do have some, they may have some restrictions or blackout days if you want to use your travel rewards, while others are more flexible in how you can redeem them or, you know, get cash back and things like that. I personally don't like the cash back option. I would prefer to use it for travel, quite honestly, because your dollars go further when you use them for travel versus if they give you cash back. I hope that makes sense. Now, just make sure you understand that redemption process before you take advantage of the rewards and also make sure you know if they expire and all that fun stuff. Managing this credit responsibly. So while you are optimizing your credit card usage for rewards, it's so crucial, you guys, that you manage your credit responsibly. Now, I know I've said this already probably three times. I'm going to say it again. This means paying your bill in full and on time each month to avoid interest charges and late fees. You're just you're literally using your credit card to just earn points and, you know, pay, put off your payment a little bit. And then you just pay it once every month. Now I have automatically set up, and this is something I highly suggest you do is that you set your credit card to be paid in full every single month directly from your checking account. Super important. Then you set it and forget it. And then you don't have to think about, ooh, am I spending too much? You just know this is your daily expenses. This is what you normally pay. There should be no reason why that money isn't going to be available to pay off that card. And you also have to remember not to mess with the money in your checking account that is going to be paying towards that card. Okay. Now, something else you want to think about and really have top of mind is keeping track of your credit utilization ratio. Whoa, I know, right? Basically, this is just the amount of credit that you're using compared to your total available credit. So you don't want to have a credit card that has a $30,000 available credit and you're like at 29,000, right? That will start to bring your credit score down and you want to maintain a healthy credit score as part of this process. So just keep that in mind while you are utilizing this strategy. Okay. All right. Now, again, I know I mentioned that you want to go check out the points guy and do all of the strategizing. I am going to plug a link in the show notes for the Chase Sapphire Reserve, and that link will take you directly to the site. You can see what their rewards are right now. This does change, FYI. They will change them out throughout the year. I have a referral link, so you can check it out. If you click on that link, you will get 60,000 bonus points. Now, my boyfriend just did this. He got 60,000 points. And then I get like, I don't can't remember how many points I got. I think it's like 10,000 or 15 or something like that on my card from him using that link. So of course, if you love your boss bitch bestie for these tips, please use that link. If not, I still love you. And one thing that I love about this card specifically, and this hands down, I mean, I even YouTube this shit. I mean, I like I'm very serious about my credit, you guys. Like, I'm not just doing shit to do shit. So I made sure that I was making the right choices. And this was one of the best cards out there for personal spending because it gives you the highest rewards for everyday spending, which I mentioned already. Groceries, dining out. Oh, dining out is 10 points per dollar. Yeah, huge. So if you're already going to go have dinner or whatever, and it's like, it doesn't have to be dining out like fancy dining out. Like we went to, I think, I don't know, maybe ran through in and out or something like that. And I got points for that. Okay. Then again, we talked about the perks. Instacart is one through Chase, Grubhub, Uber, and Lyft, 
which is amazing. And again, they have the best points rewards for travel. So I moved all my bills to this card. I have to pay them anyways, right? So I might as well earn points to travel because for me, and I don't know about y'all, I would love to know what you think. Come find me on Instagram and let me know. But I like having nice things. Sure. You know, I enjoy things. I have a really fun car, but I'm not attached to those things. I'm more interested in making memories and doing things that are fun and exciting rather than collecting more shit, right? Like when I moved, you guys, like, oh my God, I got rid of so much stuff and I'm like, I don't need this crap. Like, it's stupid for me. I don't need just excess of dumb kitchen stuff or trinkets and knickknacks and things like that. I'm like, no, I want to do things. I don't want a house full of shit. I want a brain full of memories. Okay. Now I'm going to move on to the next two and these are more business related. So if you don't have a business, maybe just skip past this part, you know, maybe, I don't know, skip forward a minute or two, but the MX Platinum is has a high annual fee, but all of my expenses for the business go here. Okay. Now, some of these cards will charge you an annual fee and that might give you a little bit of cold fee in signing up for them. But let me tell you with the perks that you get from them, such as like clear and, you know, Instacart and all these things, it really pays for itself. And then with the Amex Platinum, because you get perks like the Century and Lounge for travel and all the travel bennies that come with the Amex Platinum, it's a thousand percent worth it. Like getting into the lounge, y'all, if you have not done that, I'm sorry, it is life changing because you all of a sudden just are like, okay, I actually don't mind going to the airport. Like we went to the airport three hours early so I could work in the lounge. We could chill. We could have some food. We can have some champagne or whatever and just be like, enjoying our chill time before it was time to board. So this one's going to earn you the most points for travel. Now, this is when you book through their site. If you book through their site, you'll get five points for every dollar on hotels and flights. And then you can also use your travel points to book these things. So if you want to use part of your points and then you have a balance, then that gets transferred into more points. Do you see how this is working out? You're going to travel anyways. You're going to do all the things anyways you might as well do it. Then you get clear, which is the airport speedy line, um, which is amazing. I believe that's almost like a $200 value. Again, worth the annual fee. I think the annual fee might be a little bit high. Also with the MX Platinum, you also will get a $200 airline credit. So, or tra- I believe it's a travel credit. So anytime you use anything that's airline related, you'll get a $200 credit on your statement, which is amazing. So I have a link for that one too. My besties, you'll get 150,000 points if you own a business and you use my link. Of course, I'll love you forever for that because, you know, we'd be scratching each other's backs here. You get points. I get points. Maybe we'll travel together. Maybe we'll have a besties, best boss bitch besties retreat and we're just all traveling on our travel fucking points. Okay. That is my, my dream for a utopian world. All right. Then we have the Amex gold card. This one is also for my business, but they also, you can also use it for personal as well. Now, the reason why I want two Amex cards for the business is because the Amex gold card will give me more points for groceries and gas. And I am using a business card for gas. So it makes sense if you have a business vehicle or whatever, this is a good card to use for gas. You'll get more points versus just like one point per dollar. And this is also the better one out of the two American Expresses to use for dining out. So if you have business dinners and that thing, those types of things, if you do a lot of shipping, you will get more points. This is also where you'll want to utilize the Uber and Lyft credits because the gold card on Amex for business is where it's at. And then you have a 250 statement $250 statement credit for FedEx, Grubhub, or office supplies. Okay, great one, great perks. And then last but not least, just one more little tip on this whole system of hacking with points is I highly encourage you sign up for hotel reward programs as well, because you can use these in tandem. And I know this feels like a lot to manage and a lot to deal with, but I promise you, dump this into a Google spreadsheet, right, where I have like my rewards for every card so I know when to use what. And then I also have a list of my rewards programs that I'm enrolled in. So when I book hotels, I know 
I can look at any of these hotel rewards programs. And like the other day, I stayed in a Wyndham resort for free overnight. I think I paid $40 for the resort fees for like a $200 room because I had some points that accumulated. So you want to sign up for Hyatt, you want to sign up for Marriott, and you want to sign up for Wyndham. And I will have the links for those programs in the show notes for you as well for those rewards programs. I don't get anything for for those. So there's they're not referral links, but at least you won't have to think much. Just click and sign up and it's free. Okay. Some other investment things to think about, right? Focusing on the long term. So low cost index fund investments rather than trying to beat the market with individual stock picks. Whoa, a lot of words. But this was just one tip that I took from the book that might resonate with you. Some other things are increasing your overall money, your wealth, and things like that is don't be afraid to negotiate for a higher salary. So he talks in the book about learning how to confidently negotiate for a higher pay, better benefits. And he also goes into some tactics for discussing salary during job interviews and performance reviews. So if this sounds like something up your alley, definitely worth it because like I've always said, and I know this is not a me saying, I heard this from a they, the people, the people that say the things, is unless you ask, the answer is always no. And it doesn't hurt to ask. Then he talks about conscious spending. And I feel like this goes hand in hand with what I'm saying about making sure that you are paying off your credit card every single month and also understanding and shifting your focus from having to be like a strict budgeter to consciously spending. And you do that by identifying and prioritizing your spending on the things that bring you the most value and joy, right? Remember, at the top of the episode, we talked about the different buckets of where your money should go to work for you to have a rich life. And part of that is your fun bucket, right? Like having a different bucket. Now, one thing I didn't have on here to cover, but I do think is is very important is When you do this process, it helps if you have separate checking accounts, which I know sounds like a pain in the ass. And listen, I did this for my business probably about four or five years ago when I started working with like a bookkeeper and a CPA and they were going to do some, they were going to manage my money with allocating it into certain buckets, right? For my business. So what I decided to do was do that for my personal spending. So it's very helpful if you do that. So that way, when you sit down to do your finances, I like to do mine every Friday where I sit and take a hard look at everything, is I will put the money where it needs to go. And then I just, I don't negotiate with myself for anything else, okay? So that's super important. And identifying like what brings you the most value and joy? Where do you want to spend that money? Do you want to travel? Do you want to invest in some kind of class or course or something that you've been wanting to do or enjoy or sign up for a personal trainer or something that has been on your radar? You can do that when you know where your money is going and you actually can utilize that money for things that are going to improve your life, bring you value and joy. Okay. Then he talks about debt management, which we talked about at the beginning, which is my favorite, which is Dave Ramsey. But Rami also covers a lot of that as well, which is developing a plan for paying off the high interest debt while you'll, you'll still be saving and investing for your future. Okay. So you can still do these things, have your bucket of fun money and all that while paying off your debt. You don't have to be debt free to enjoy your life. And that's why I love Rami because I'd be like, you be speaking my language, man. Like I don't have debt, but I know people have debt. And I was like very intrigued by his process. Okay. So just to recap some things with the savings account stuff I had talked about, I moved my savings from basic bitch chase. I like kicked them right in the nutsack. And I was like, listen, motherfuckers, I'm taking my in my savings account and I'm marching my ass over to a high yield savings account with one of the best online banks that's reputable out there because I did my fucking research. OK, and there are a handful, but I decided to go with Marcus, which not a big name, right? It's not a big name like Chase. However, they are well touted in the financial spheres 
And also, again, with my own research and watching all the things and reading all the things, this was the best place to go. Now, the high yield savings is going to give you 4.5% money back based off of how much you have in your account, which is fucking fantastic just for your money sitting there. Now, I have a link for my besties. And if you click on this link, it's a referral link now, but this will give you an additional 1%. These links are kind of hard to find. And once you have a Marcus account, you can start sharing them with your friends and your family too. And that will give you an additional 1%, which doesn't seem like a lot. But as your money builds, friends, this is how you just make money in your sleep with little effort with no effort, right? And again, this isn't like hand over fist money in your sleep. But again, it's some change in your account that wasn't going to be there when it was in your basic bitch chase account. Okay. So I'll put the link in the show notes, which is to Marcus and you can check that out. And again, I moved from Chase to Schwab. And I do have a link for my frenzies for the Schwab account. You're going to want to look for the investment checking. You don't have to have any like investments and they're going to want to have you open up another like side account with it that you can just keep for free. And just, I don't have anything in that because I use, I use another account for my investing. So I just wanted the checking. Okay. Because it earns interest as well. Now I have a link for you guys. It is going to give you a referral bonus, which is pretty sweet. It is, let's see. You get up to $1,000 when you make a qualifying deposit within 45 days of opening an account, okay, which is wonderful. Now, I don't get a kickback for that. So Schwab, hey, Schwab, you need to do better, okay? But anyhow, the link is there. It will give you a bonus just for me sharing. So if you want to change over to a checking account that isn't a basic bitch checking account like Chase, I highly suggest it. I'm a little mad at Chase, okay? Now, then you want to automate your finances. This is the part that is key for set it and forget it, and you just stay disciplined, right? We talked about that at the beginning of the episode. You set up automatic transfers, so that way you're having money automatically transferred into your savings, automatically transferred into your investment accounts if you set those up outside of your place of work, right? Like I am a business owner, so I had to set up my own, you know, investment accounts. And this will ensure consistent savings and investing without the need for constant monitoring, okay? Super important. And the book is very motivating. You can see what doing this adds up to over time. Now, the other thing is I set up my Schwab checking directly to my high yield savings account with Marcus. So every two weeks, a specific amount gets deducted from my checking and gets dumped right into my high yield savings so I can keep earning money in that high yield savings account. Once you get your credit cards with the rewards points, you want to move all of your bills to this credit card. And then you want to set up automatic payments from your checking to your credit cards. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, go into your Chase and you can set up an automatic payment. It'll have you connect your bank account, do all those fun things. And then you know, whatever day of the month that is, it'll deduct from your checking account. It'll pay your credit card off in full. Now, bonus tip and there are plenty of these in the book, let me just tell you, and this is the only reason why I even knew this was a possibility, because remember, unless you ask, the answer is always no, is you want to set this up that times appropriately with your pay, right? Like if you get paid weekly or biweekly or monthly or however you get paid, you want to set this up so it makes sense. Now, that might not align with your credit card's due date. So what I did was I called American Express and I said, hey, I would like to make sure that I'm strategizing my payments and I need to see if I can move my payment date by three days. And that just falls in line with the pulse of how I move my money. And they were like, sure, not a problem. I was like, whoa, okay, that was easy. Thanks, Remy. So that is something that I would highly suggest you do if you're need. If you like, no, this won't work for me because I got the card and the due date is on the 13th and I don't get paid till the 15th. Well, guess what? Call them and they can move that shit for you. And then your problem is solved. Now, some key things is there is an important psychology piece to a lot of this. So understanding your own personal like psychological barriers to your financial success, which is 
there's so many possibilities that stop people from doing things, right? Like fear of investing or you're reluctant to like negotiate things or you don't want to learn strategies or, you know, things like that. So you have to really be willing to change some of your old programming with how you think about money and the things that you were taught or weren't taught, okay? The other thing is investing in yourself is so important, right? Investing in personal and professional development to increase your earning potential. (laughs) People don't think about that, but in decreasing your earning potential and your overall life satisfaction. And this can come from your bucket of fun money if you don't have a business or maybe you are comfortable in your professional career or whatever, but doing some personal development things, investing in yourself. Again, we come back to the conversation of your health and wellness because that is an investment you'll never regret making most most of the time. Depends if you get a shitty, if you, if you invest in a shitty, if you invest in a shitty coach, okay, but don't be doing that. Okay, so the other thing is I don't like quick fixes. Y'all know how I feel about quick fixes when it comes to diet and exercise. With your wealth and your money, this should be no different. So be patient with building wealth gradually. And I want to emphasize the importance of consistent, gradual process in building your wealth over time rather than seeking out quick fixes or get rich quick schemes, okay? This is so key when we see things where like, oh, make a million dollars in six weeks or some shit like that on Instagram, right? Or YouTubes. It's likely not, it's likely not that easy. Okay. So you, these, these things take time, but again, time is going to pass anyway. So you might as well do it the right way. And then last but not least is creating a rich life. So you have to define what a rich life means to you personally. And that is just beyond financial wealth. And you need to make intentional choices that align with those values. So good, right? So good. And again, for me, I like traveling. I want to do things. I want to experience things. I want to experience the world and different you know, cultures and cities and states and restaurants and gyms. And like, those are the things that I love to do and value. And being financially secure is a huge piece of being able to do that. Okay. This was a long one. Thank you for hanging out here. But just to recap, you got to get out of debt. So hit the Dave Ramsey book hard, take a weekend, knock it out, build a strategy, watch Ramit's show. Start binge watching. If you have a partner, I highly encourage this is something you watch together, especially if money conversations are challenging ones for you to have. This opens up the conversation for you to get curious with your partner and have conversations like, well, what if we did that? Oh, gosh, we kind of do that. Or maybe we should try that. Right. And just having conversations and making money conversations not scary. Okay. Buy the book. I Will Teach You to Be Rich by Ramit Sethi. Get a notepad, get your laptop. I don't know, get some hieroglyphics going. I don't know, whatever you need to do, wherever you're going to remember it, wherever you're going to do the work. The next one. Now, this was my strategy. You might not have the time budget for this, but I spent in the very beginning of this year, I spent about 30 minutes a day and let's just be real, I spent probably like two hours a day in the very beginning because I was very excited, but now I'm about 30 minutes a day in the morning tackling the items in the book because there's so much there that you can do. It's like a gold mine, you guys. Okay. And then you're going to be able to create wealth on your terms and spend money on what you want when it's allocated in the right spots without feeling guilty or stressed because you'll know all your other shit is handled right? Because you have set it up properly. All right, you guys, there you have it. As we move into the wrap up, I want to leave you with two things to think about. Number one, where are you spending frivolously that could be going towards your improvement of health, body goals, life, lifestyle, enjoyment in general, right? Where are you spending frivolously? I know for a lot of people that is a lot of 
excess things like DoorDash and Starbucks and lots of fast food purchases and Amazon. Y'all, I took my credit cards off of my Amazon account. This was another hack that was in the book. This is a side extra bonus note. And what I did was, and this is another way to hack the credit card spending travel or to hack the credit card points. And this is a fun one is rather than having my credit card attached to my Amazon, what I did was when I went to the grocery store, I used my Chase Sapphire to buy my groceries because you get a lot more points back when you use that. I purchased an Amazon gift card, which also earned me more points towards my grocery bill, right? Because I bought a $300 Amazon, $300 worth of Amazon uh, credit and with my groceries. So my grocery bill was, I don't know, like 400 bucks or whatever, which that $400 then earned me points on my Sapphire card. And then I just uploaded that Amazon card to my account. And then I just used that. And guess what? My Amazon spending has gone down significantly. Okay. Significantly. I still have probably $250 on that. And that was almost two months ago, right? When I was like ordering shit from Amazon every week, just dumb shit. Now, the second thing is be patient. You're relearning new ways of interacting with your finances. It's going to be rocky. It's a new relationship, right? You're committed to a new process. It's like a new fitness goal. Everything is great and fine in the honeymoon period. And then you get a little bit cranky about it. You may slip up. It's learning like learning a new diet. It's not going to be perfect but keep working on it. All right. I hope you enjoyed this episode. This one was fun for me. This is why it was, you know, well over an hour long because I am like very new to a lot of these things all working together synergistically for future wealth and, you know, honestly, stress relief with finances. So I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed putting it together with you. I love sharing like tips and tricks and do's and don'ts from my personal experience. and. I hope you enjoy. So I can't wait to come back next week and uh, I'll see you soon. Bye for now, besties. Peace.